Today on The Bottom Line, is it finally over for Chipotle? More genius from Amazon and another strategist, Brian Levitt, says the party is going to go on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Bottom Line. I'm Henry Blodgett, here with my co-host, Sarah Silverstein. More new highs for the market, and Sarah has found another strategist who thinks we're just at the beginning. Brian Levitt of Oppenheimer Funds is here, and he says the only thing that can kill this rally is the Fed. We also have a story about your favorite lunch place. Chipotle, the cratering high flyer. Is it over? And then Amazon's latest genius. This is the smartest company in the world. We'll get right to it. Is it over for Chipotle? This is a former high flyer and one of my favorite restaurants, I will confess. But the stock is down more than 60% since the peak in 2015. Sarah has a story. Chipotle reported its third quarter results on Tuesday after the closing bell, and they missed on the top and bottom line. They also lowered expectations for same-store sales and for the number of restaurants they expect to open. The stock dropped after hours and opened about 13% down the next morning. The stock is down over 20% year-to-date. But the real story everyone was looking at was this introduction of queso that Chipotle brought out. I think they introduced it September 12th. And things started to turn even before they reported earnings because consumers didn't seem super excited about the queso. RBC put out a note on Friday before the earnings entitled Worst Queso Scenario, where the analyst dropped his price target from $400 to $330. They, he has since lowered it even further to $320. But what he did was he analyzed the social media response to queso over the period and basically the response to Chipotle, the negative tweets for Chipotle far like started to peak and the positive tweets started to drop and the response to queso on Twitter was all negative, um, very few positive tweets. So some people thought this queso marketing blitz could save Chipotle. Nobody thinks that anymore. Is it the final nail in the coffin? UBS says it, it, this is the new normal for Chipotle, that there, there's no bounce back. So another thing that I saw this week was, I believe, at Bank of America coming out and saying, look, we're downgrading Chipotle because they pay their employees too much. And I just want to say, from an economic perspective and the United States, it is great if that's true, if Chipotle is paying its employees a lot. That is wonderful. That's what all of our companies need to do. And I have to say, it's been a high flyer stock. So what if the stock goes down, if that's what's going on? And defending Chipotle, it is still great. I eat there all the time, and I have to say, I am glad that there is less of a line. It's great. I don't want queso anyway. I don't care. So I, I am fine with where Chipotle is. I think that they probably liked the lines. I think that helped. I think that and they do pay the, the, their employees more than that's wonderful, and they have great employees. I like the service at Chipotle a lot. They never let the sour cream or the guacamole touch my burrito, which is very important to me. Um, but have you tried the queso? I have not. Okay. I don't care. Yeah, me but either. This gets to the point. Again, this stock ran up to a, a sky-high level on this momentum of their opening new stores, the story around the world, everything else. I don't think it's necessarily over. Again, it's a high-quality restaurant. They had a couple of unforced errors. They had the disease outbreaks and other things. So these are, these are bad situations. But there's no reason they can't actually continue to improve and grow from there. But will the stock ever trade at the multiple that it did before? Who knows? But if not, they're just going through exactly the same change of phase that so many companies have gone through, which is they're a momentum story. All the Mo guys pile in. Stock goes to the moon. Then the Mo story breaks. Then you go through several years of consolidation. And then eventually, it just becomes a good company with a much more reasonably priced stock. And hopefully, that's where we are. Amazon, over the past couple of months, have done something that sort of solidifies its candidacy for the smartest company in the world, and that is announced that it is opening a new headquarters somewhere and inviting cities to pitch for it. And I have to say that this particular approach that Amazon has taken, they could have taken another approach. They could have announced that after a year of study, they have decided to open a new headquarters in one particular city. What would have happened then? There would have been some cheers in the city. There would have been a lot of frustration everywhere else in the country. And then there would probably be giant protests in the city. We don't want a big headquarters. We don't want more fulfillment, so forth. Instead, Amazon did the brilliant thing. They said, hey, we're thinking of moving. Tell us where we should move. And now 
238 cities in the country are desperately competing for Amazon's new headquarters. Sarah, this is brilliant. It's working out great. They are going to score with wherever they finally choose. And 238 cities did um, make a bid to get Amazon, and only seven states, according to Amazon, didn't have a city that submitted, and some of the cities are in Canada and Mexico, and some of them are actually quite funny. One of the places that said they're not interested, Arkansas actually took out a full page ad in the Washington Post and wrote a, like a breakup note to them saying, hey, Amazon, we need to talk. It's not you, it's us. You're smart, sexy, and frankly, incredibly rich. You'll find what you're looking for, it's just not us. But the people that are trying so hard to get Amazon, um, some of them are really funny. The, a city in Georgia suggested they rename their 348 five-acre town, Amazon, Georgia. Uh, Calgary proposed combining names and calling the town Kalmazon or Amagari, which is a terrible name. The mayor in Kansas City, Missouri, actually bought 1,000 Amazon products and um, gave them all five-star ratings. Tucson sent a 21-foot cactus, and Amazon said, we don't accept gifts, so they donated it to a desert museum, which I didn't know they had. But they say they don't accept gifts, but they do accept tax subsidies and economic um, incentives. And New Jersey's offering tax breaks worth $7 billion. Memphis is offering $60 million in economic incentives. And the question is, 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 this, is this necessary? Is this just more the rich getting richer? Is it fair? But is it great for cities? What do you think? It's great for cities. I mean, in that, they've identified something that we often forget in this country, the idea that a, a company moves to a particular place, they get tax breaks, suddenly people start carping about, oh, they got bribed, all this tax loss, tax revenue, et cetera. The point is that if the company doesn't move there, there's zero tax revenue. So any new economic activity because a company has chosen a city is additive. They're not giving up anything. They're getting it. Those folks who move there, they're going to pay property taxes. They're going to buy stuff. They're going to buy stuff from local stores. It's only good. So it's great that everybody's pitching. They should be. Again, I want to come back to the salesmanship. This little example, one of the first business books that I read 150 years ago, How to Swim with the Sharks Without Being Alive, the author Harvey McKay told this story about two companies that were thinking of opening a mall in a particular city. And the dumb company picked the city and announced it. And there was immediately this huge protest. We don't want them here. It's bad. They're going to ruin the neighborhood, all that stuff. The other smarter company said, we're going to open a huge mall in some lucky city somewhere. Bring us your ideas. Suddenly, they're besieged by cities saying, oh, please, us. Here are all the gifts and tax incentives and everything else. It's just great salesmanship. And you pointed out earlier, what a marketing play for Amazon here, too. And Birmingham built like giant Amazon boxes in those dash buttons, which you know people use to order paper towels and just put them around the city. So even the stuff, even if they're not going to get the incentives they, that all the cities are offering, people are just doing stuff to make Amazon like them more, which is great free advertising. Brilliant. <laughs> Fidelity Viewpoints Chart of the Week focuses on U.S. real exports as a percentage of U.S. GDP, and it shows that it's still at all-time highs. And Fidelity points out that, consequently, global economics may have more significant impact on U.S. stocks. And, of course, they are right. It's important to remember that U.S. stocks are not the same as the U.S. economy. For one, you can see that in the incredible rally we've seen in stocks and the middling growth that we have seen, but also there's good reason for it. Most of the U.S. employment is tied to the services sector, while if you look at the actual earnings from the S&P 500, those are tied to manufacturing and goods in large part. And that's today's Fidelity Insight. I'm here with Brian Levitt, Senior Investment Strategist at Oppenheimer Funds. Thank you for joining Thank me. Thank you. So first, the one thing that we are always talking about here, do you think the stock market is overvalued? I don't think the stock market is particularly overvalued. It, it, it's clearly trading above the long-term average, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the market is significantly overvalued. A few points to make. First and foremost is U.S. equities continue to trade cheap to bonds. Now you look at the earnings yield of stocks compared to the treasury yield, it's not clear that there's an alternative to owning the equity markets. What worries people is that they remember the late 1990s and they have this recency bias and believe that if stocks have been going up for this long, then we must be 
facing some sort of bubble. The reality is, if you look at the top 10 names of the NASDAQ stocks, in 1999, the median price to sales was over 20 times. Today, that number on the top 10 names in NASDAQ, the median price to sales is closer to five times. So that's one fourth of the valuations that you had at the height of the tech bubble. So yes, stocks are somewhat above their long-term average. That should be expected when the global economy is growing and policy is accommodative. We're nowhere near that point of significant concern yet. And when you look at the individual stocks, do you see any standouts that are overvalued or undervalued? Well, the market has been favoring growth in a slow growth world rather than value stocks. And it's sort of paradoxical when there's no growth, you buy growth. When there's a lot of growth, you buy value. So since we've been in this slow growth environment, investors have been bidding up those names that are growing. And in the United States, it's the so-called FANG stocks. But also, if you were to compare those stocks to the valuations of some of the bellwether stocks of the 1990s, Intel, Oracle, EMC, Cisco, Microsoft, their valuations are also not even close. Some might push back and say, well, Netflix, Amazon, on a price-to-earnings basis are very expensive. I would tell them to look at a price-to-sales basis on Amazon, which, by the way, is a better predictor of future returns. On a price-to-sales basis, Amazon is pretty reasonably priced. And that's not necessarily a stock suggestion. It's just simply saying that you need to look a little bit deeper than come up with this, these hyperbolic statements that the FANG stocks are so overvalued. It's simply not true. So you don't think that there's a big stock market correction coming right now, but what about the economic growth picture? Or how does that look? So the economic growth picture has been very consistent since the 2008 financial crisis. It's been a prolonged deleveraging environment for consumers, and you know even the Bible says you have seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. So this hasn't particularly been famine, but it's been below trend growth. And when you grow consistently at 2% quarter over quarter, that's reasonably good for corporate earnings. It doesn't bring forth inflation, so you don't get the policy tightening that ultimately ends cycles. That's really good for market participants and has been. It's not so great for politicians who want to get reelected. Uh, it may not be so great for people on Main Street who want wage growth, but the reality is this modest growth rate is good for markets and likely means that this cycle continues far longer than many people expect, so long as we don't have a major policy mistake somewhere in the world. Is that the biggest risk to markets and the economy? Yeah, the biggest change? risk to markets right now is that we simply don't know what the composition of the Federal Reserve is going to be. We don't know who's going to be chairing the Federal Reserve. And when you're in an environment, I mean, the last month or so, 10-year Treasury rates have gone up. So you're at 240 on the 10-year, you're at 125 on the Fed funds rate. That's a reasonably steep yield curve to support credit growth and to support the economy. If the Federal Reserve attempts to get too tight, you could see long rates come to, you know, be a game of chicken. You could see long rates start to come back down, which could forestall this economic expansion. Now, if Janet Yellen is the Fed chair, that is highly unlikely. She has been very dovish throughout her tenure. If John Taylor is the Fed chair, that's a different story, and the markets might have to reconsider where we're going with policy. So with regards to market corrections, volatility typically picks up when you have policy volatility. Why, have there, why has there been no volatility for so long? There's been no policy volatility. When was the last time we had a big market correction? 2015 into 2016, when the Fed raised rates and the bond market didn't like it. So we could see that game of chicken in the beginning part of 2018. I suspect the Fed will back off. If there is a market correction around that, in my opinion, it would ultimately represent a buying opportunity. Are there any policy things that could affect the markets positively? Yeah, so right now we're going through uh, the tax reform legislation, or whether we call it tax reform or tax cuts, we will see. Right now, the tax cuts look as if they're going to amount to $5 trillion over 10 years, but through the congressional budget processing, um, they're, not, they're not going to be allowed to expand the net deficits over $1.5 over the next 10 years. So they have to find offsets 
And those offsets are going to come from what deductions that we all like that we're going to lose. That is really difficult. If it happens, and I would still call it a big if, if it happens, you should expect growth to be increased in the quarters ahead, which means, in my opinion, Treasury rates will back up, giving the Fed some room to raise short-term interest rates. But it means that market leadership will shift, as it has for the last few weeks, from growth stocks to value stocks. Again, when there's more growth by value, it'll also likely favor smaller cap companies who pay higher effective tax rates right now than large cap companies and stand to benefit more. And it'll favor perhaps parts of the market that had underperformed for a number of years, things like the financial sector, the industrial sector. I mean, the industrial, the industrial sector will benefit from being able to depreciate capital investments 100%. Right? It's a pretty big deal for their earnings per share. Perhaps some of the energy names uh, will benefit from that as well. So my base case is we continue as we've been. We don't get significant stimulus, large caps, growth, and growth where you can find it, which is in emerging markets, surprisingly Japan, and in a lot of instances, companies in Europe whereas the value parts of the market are, may remain a value trap in the U.S. if there's no catalyst to propel them forward. And last question, what do you think is the thing that everybody gets wrong about the markets right now? I think what everybody gets wrong is that they look at political volatility and they look at relatively weak growth and believe that the market is too good to be true. They see a handful of tweets they see Jeff Flake uh, standing on the Senate floor and uh, essentially disowning a president from his own party. And they worry that there's a proverbial shoe to drop. And what's the difference between political volatility and policy volatility? So political volatility is focusing specifically on the executive and legislative branches of government when you do not see things change significantly. Now, there's been some executive orders, and we can quibble about the reasonableness and efficacy of those executive orders, but I'm talking about significant legislation. In essence, nothing's really changed. Like headlines versus legislation. Exactly. We've told people for years, hating the government is not an investment strategy. I focus far more a couple of miles southwest from 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue at the U.S. Federal Reserve, and I'm talking about monetary policy. You know, Rudy Dornbush, the famed economist, said of all the market cycles, none of them die of old age. They all die when they're ultimately murdered by the Federal Reserve with interest rate hikes. So that's where my primary focus is. Now, when the facts change, I'll change my opinion, too. Should we get significant legislation out of Congress and signed by the president, then we will perhaps signal a change in where we think market leadership is going to be. Without that, we suspect that this current environment continues and stocks are unlikely, this rally is unlikely to end with a lot of Americans not liking it. More Americans played the lottery last year than bought equities and with stocks still trading cheap to bonds. Great, Brian, thank you so much. Thank you. That's it for this week. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to NASDAQ MarketSite for hosting us. And thanks to Fidelity Investments for making the show possible. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you next week.